Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who's curious about technical topics. You can contact me at any time at mrvanderpool901 at gmail.com. You can also find PDF versions of my notes and presentation slides linked in the video description below. I am doing a series of presentations on two inter-networking models the OSI 7 layer and the four layer internet model. This will continue with a series of videos on each layer. I will explore and hopefully contribute to your appreciation of this complex internetworking stack. If you've missed the first video, you can go to my channel as shown here and simply go to the search bar and you can type in understanding internetworking models or OSI and you should pull up video that you see on the screen. A huge thanks to the many companies that I'll be sharing their products and information in this presentation. This kind of presentation could not be possible without the generosity of many companies and organizations sharing publicly their data, drawings, and product information. Most IT professionals simply don't have the luxury to spend time learning in depth all the technology that they work with every day. Their workload is too demanding. So my goal is to quickly take you deeper into layer one of the OSI layer and understand better this physical layer. Layer one has this wealth of technology, companies, and products that make this a fascinating topic. And I will not in this short video give this topic coverage it deserves, but I hope you'll come away with a good review of the basics of what happens at layer one. More money is spent at layer one than all the other layers combined. More companies produce products at this layer than all the other OSI layers combined. Now I'm cheating a little bit because most companies produce products that span at least layer one and layer two of the OSI layer. And other companies do the entire OSI layer and much, much more. To my surprise, I discovered that layer one has the highest concentration of scientists, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, structural engineers, mathematicians, physicists, than all other six layers combined. Each layer of your network stack is carefully wrapping your application data, data that's coming from your browsers, that are coming from internet, any kind of application that is directly connected to the network stack. And that data will communicate with a distant host. Layer two is responsible for the final preparation of data to survive the conversion to voltage signals, light pulses, or modulated RF energy. So what is layer one? Well, it's basically getting data from one host to another, whether it's a cubicle next to you or an individual in Tokyo, Japan. Raise your respect for layer one. This physical layer of the OSI has to take your data to some really hostile places and environments. These photos are actually light pulses from a laser 13,212 kilometers away via a fiber optic cable under the ocean. Layer one is carefully engineered light pulses, voltage signals, or modulated RF energy. 4G LTE and 5G antenna and power amplifiers are critical layer one for every mobile phone user. SpaceX and others are taking layer one to outer orbit, designing satellites which will provide internet access for millions of folks who without them are falling behind in a global economy. These satellite antennas and RF transmissions are, guess what, layer one. Layer one covers antennas and fiber and those millions and millions of miles of buried cable. Layer one is found on those poles. Layer one is jacks, plugs, and cables. Layer one is that coax cable that brings TV and internet to your home called the last mile. And layer one is the high-speed metro ethernet connecting cities all over the globe. It's the submarine cables connecting the continents, pushing speeds of two terabits per second on a single fiber. 
Layer one is the new coherent optical modems that can push data in a data center up to 500 gigabits per second. Layer one can de demand micron level accuracy. This preci precision is needed in manufacturing and designing today's fiber optic cables. Let's pause and take a hard look at what happens at layer one. The physical layer can actually be broken down into three sub layers. Let's look at each of them. Let's zoom in and look at these layers. The first one is called physical coding sub layer. It's responsible for coding and encoding data streams from layer two. The second one is physical medium attachment, and it's responsible for converting data from parallel to serial and vice versa. And the last is the physical medium dependent sublayer. It's responsible for signal transmission. It includes amplifiers, modulation, and wave shaping. It's here where we're gonna find amplifiers, LEDs, and lasers. This is a generic block diagram of a typical network card. And it is always, layer one is always gonna be chips, integrated circuits, printed circuit boards, amplifiers, signal processors, LEDs, and lasers. But I want you to look carefully at this block diagram because it has all three sublayers. It has the encoding part. It has our parallel to serial. And then when it comes from serial back into parallel. And finally, the amplifiers that drive the voltages, the LEDs and the lasers or RF transmission to an antenna. It's all on this block diagram. Here's the latest 10 gigabit ethernet and it's got a block diagram much like we just saw. This is a new Mellanox data center grade network card that runs at over 200 gigabits per second per port. This is incredible signal processing technology. The problem of generating the signals is challenging enough without adding distance and the media we put the signal on. Once this carefully designed signal is placed on the media, it has a tough job of getting to the destination, yet alone being readable by the receiver. In the real world, signals are distorted by connectors, interference, reflection, signal loss, dispersion, and just a long list of signal characteristics that impact the quality of the signal as it moves down any type of media. We can start with this ideal pulse, and by the time it gets 200 kilometers away, it looks like this on the right. The PCS sublayer is about encoding and decoding. This critical function improves signal reliability. Let's review the basics. Let's say we take a binary one and we represent it with a high voltage, as you can see on the bottom in the graph below. And for a binary zero, we'll just represent it with a zero voltage. And again, we raise the voltage to a high level and that represents a one. Well, that seems simple enough. And if we send that from one device to another, why not? In the world of digital transmission, as long as you're dealing with very low speeds and the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is short, it works all day. But the minute you start raising your speed above a few kilobits per second, or you extend the distance between the host, the transmitter and the receiver, this gets ugly really quick. So what are the problems that face digital transmission? They, these signal characteristics that we're going to talk about impact RF, laser, twisted pair, you name it, things like reflection, where the signal reflects back into the receiver, scattering, where the signal scatters back into multiple new signals, refraction, where the signal bends as it travels through an object such as glass. This impacts laser and fiber optics a lot. Diffraction, where the signal changes direction as it passes around an object. And attenuation, how many times have you stood with a good RF signal on one side of a wall, walked through the other side of the wall, like a concrete uh, block wall, and you lost all signal? That's called attenuation. All of these characteristics impact any kind of digital transmission. Encoding is a technique to represent binary data so the signal pattern produced 
produces greater transmission reliability. No matter the encoding technique, if both the transmitter and the receiver use the same pattern, the data value remains the same. If you look at the top, you'll see the data. 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Or translate that into decimal, it's 311. If you'll look below the clock signal, you'll see NRZ, RZ, NRZI, Manchester, Miller, biphase, dash M. All of those are different encoding techniques. Notice the signal pattern of each of them. They're very different. What engineers have found out is these pattern techniques that represent the same 311 actually produce greater reliability when transmitting digital data over longer distances or high speeds or with greater ability to re reject interference. These are critical to digital transmission. Shown in this diagram are two very popular encoding techniques. One is return to zero and non-return to zero. The all 10 gig and below optical technology is based on non-return to zero. Let's look at return to zero first. You can see the binary bits above. You can see that for any period of time, like we'll take a look at zero at the very beginning on the left, you'll see that the pulse goes low and then comes back up to zero and comes over until where a period of time where we go to a binary high. And then the pulse goes high and comes back down at some period back to zero. If you'll look at the pattern, it's totally different from the non-return to zero pattern below. Both of these are very effective in transmitting reliable binary data across wires, fiber optics, even RF transmissions. Many encoding techniques using bioptical fiber are critical to their reliability. In order to reach 9.6 terabits per second, there are two very effective encoding techniques. One, PAM2 dash non-return to zero, and you can look at the pattern of digital data there. And then the PAM4, very different representations of the same data. But these are critical to get reliability transmission. Fiber faces the same signal problems as twisted pair cables, just like we see with RF transmission. The physical medium attachment, or the PMA sublayer, is responsible for converting parallel data to serial and serial to parallel. You can only look at a card like this. Uh, this is a server-based network card running at 25 gigabits at each port, and you are stunned at the complexity of trying to do such a thing as take 25 gigabits of parallel data, convert it into serial streams and vice versa. The signal processing that goes on in these kinds of cards is just mind blowing. Here's a block diagram of some of the circuitry that is used to create this serial to parallel and parallel to serial. It is incredibly complex. Here's a piece of stunning engineering. This is a server card, network card, and you can see it pumps out 50 gigabits per port. It just blows my mind. This is a PS250 board. You can see right in the dead center, it's got a 64-bit ARM chip, SOC, which probably is designed for your signal processing. You can see DDR4 everywhere. It's got three chips of DDR4 to handle the massive buffering has to go on to pump that kind of data through. And then it's got a PAM4 encoder chip dedicated just to encoding. This kind of complex technology is truly amazing. And on the back of the board is 128 gigs of flash for an operating system and a file system on the back side of this board. The physical medium dependent or the PMD sublayer is responsible for the signal transmission. This includes amplifiers, modulation, and wave shaping. Here we see the PDM layer, PDM sublayer of two hosts. We see drivers and receivers. These are LEDs for laser optics. And then we have optical sensors on the receiver side. At the PMD layer, we can drive as little as two volts peak to peak on twisted pair. We can drive the LED or the laser optics and receivers on fiber optics, or we can drive up to 200 watts power to an antenna that can pump a signal 13 kilometers away. Finally, the signal is on the media. Wow, our troubles are over, right? Not quite. 
Once we get our signal on the media, now we have all kinds of new problems. If our connector, like the one shown here, has too many, too much wires untwisted, or the jacket is removed too far back on the neck, or we've got air gaps between the pairs, all of that begins to create problems. Things like near-end crosstalk, where we begin to have the transmitting of the signal in one pair into the signal of the other pair or far in crosstalk, where we, at the other end, we get that same injection of the signal from one pair into the pair of the other. If wires are not twisted tightly, the result is near-end crosstalk. All of us have been on a phone call and have heard in the background the phone conversation of somebody else. This is known as crosstalk. We, when we leak signal from one pair into other pairs and if you look down below you can see that one single pair is actually leaking into all three other pairs this is known as this measurement of that leakage is known as power sum next or ps next here you see a uh, bundled cables coming down of cat5 and they're punched down into a patch bay these bring their own trouble poorly punched down cable a patch bay jack that's faulty, a connector has a manufacturer defect, or worse, low quality cable chosen by the contractor who won the lowest bid. And it gets worse. As we bundle all our cables together, we can start getting alien crosstalk, where the signals in one cable begin to bleed into other cables in the bundle. Testing cable after installation is critical to proper transmission. So one bad connector in a patch panel disrupts signals at layer one for all of its neighbors. Let's say we have a patch bay here and you can see I've got a manufacturing defect in this particular jack. Well, that can create harmonics and those harmonics can spread into all of its neighbors, impacting the reliability of all the other signals connected to those jacks. And on the left, you've got a user outlet and you've got a series of jacks and of course you've got a poorly installed jack right dead center and that's where the user's computer is plugged in. They're not complaining about the internet access which is probably awful. They're complaining about the jack next to it where their voice over IP is plugged in. Horrible and you're replacing cables and equipment and it's all because of a jack next to it. You can see this patch bay is a beautiful example of very good quality at layer one. And fiber has the same issues, poor quality manufacturer defect, low quality purchase from the contractor, all of those contribute to the same problems with fiber. A significant problem with fiber optics is optical light loss. You can see there's gonna be splicing, connector, connector loss, and actual the fiber optic cable. Here's an example where we see the transmitter output, and you can see the power at the high point. But as we go through fiber, there is light loss, and then we go through connectors, we lose some more. And you can see as I get to the very end, over to the right-hand side, the amount of light getting to the receiver goes down and down. This is something that has to be calculated with fiber optics. Fiber connectors and cables all play a role in good light transmission. Down below, you can see connectors that have mismatched cores or misaligned cores or air gaps between the fiber connectors. All of those are gonna create light losses or scattering. You're gonna have problems with your data transmission. Another problem is optical reflection. Here you can see two connectors joined and right here at the joint, you can see that light is being reflected back to the transmitter. This is going to create problems with digital transmission. Another one down here, you can see there is an angle or a bevel to the connection between the two mating connectors. Again, you see light reflected off. These are things that impact digital signal transmission. Do you need to clean your fiber optic connectors? Dirt can actually damage fiber permanently. 
The mating force of 2.2 pounds over 200 micrometer surface area results in about 45,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. This dirt can pit or chip your fiber optic cables. Clean your connectors. Wireless has the same problems. If you'll check out my video on 802.11ac or 802.11ax, I really cover in depth these same issues that impact wireless transmission. This applies also to cellular transmission. And layer one is doing more than just data, power over ethernet. Today we're delivering significant amount of electrical power, DC, over our cap cables. So layer one is doing more than just data. The new power over ethernet standards are pushing power values to some device up to 95 watts. Media conversion is critical at layer one. So we may need to go from 802.3 to fiber, fiber to wireless, serial to fiber, serial to 802.3. There are all kinds of companies that produce products for media conversion. This is layer one. Media conversion at layer one sometimes requires amplifying the signal, simply making the signal stronger or the light brighter. Sometimes it involves reshaping the original pulse shape. That is to use, that's to help it distinguish between ones and zeros. And many times we also at media conversion, we also restore the timing between the pulses. This usually involves optical to electronic back to optical conversion. In the future, Layer one may just plug into your CPU.